Hello, this is Peter Hughes of Financial Intergroup. On September the 17th, 2014, the Professional Risk Managers International Association, or Premier, hosted a webinar entitled Isn't It Time to Get Real on ERM? The presenters were Alan Grody, President and Founder of Financial Intergroup, and me. Unfortunately, technical issues encountered on the day caused the recording of the event to fail. Consequently, we decided to re-record it, which is the version you are watching now. At the end of the presentation, Premier's Education Director, Alex Voiku, moderated a Q&A session, which is not available on this video. Instead, we have prepared a transcript, which can be downloaded for, from our website, financialintergroup.com, and clicking on Articles. Alan and I would like to thank Premier for their generosity in hosting this event and giving Alan and me the opportunity to present and discuss our work in the area of enterprise risk management. Let me start by introducing the presenters. Alan Grody is the president and founder of Financial Intergroup. He has been involved in the financial industry as a practitioner, advisor and academic during a five decade business career. He was formerly the founder and partner in charge of Coopers and Live Brands Financial Services Consulting Practice. Professor Grody was also the founder and taught the only graduate level risk systems course at NYU's Leonard Stern School of Business. Peter Hughes is the Managing Director of Financial Intergroup's UK based operation and a visiting fellow at the Leeds University Business School in the UK. He was formerly a banker with J.P. Morgan Chase, where he held executive positions in risk management, finance, operations and audit. Our interest in an integrated enterprise-wide risk management system was initiated around the basic concept of a regulatory agenda set through the Basel Capital Accords introduced in 1988. We all assume that the progressive disciplines developed since then to report on regulatory capital would embed a risk culture, engender thoughtful understanding of risk appetite, and lead to ERM systems that would support both internal risk management needs and regulatory requirements. However, these ambitions have remained largely unfulfilled. In this presentation, we will explore six recent regulatory directives, three by the Basel Committee and three by the Financial Stability Board. Taken together, they should assist regulators in their ambition of risk adjusting the financial systems and in ours to get real about building ERM systems that allow managers to truly manage risk. We will demonstrate how to build an integrated enterprise-wide risk management system that incorporates all identified risks, credit, market, liquidity and operational risk, as well as the newest identified risk, cultural risk. We will also describe a single aggregatable measure of risk, a risk currency we call a risk unit that allows us to drill into the causal factors of risk exposures. Our work introduces a way of creating ERM systems around the new regulatory directives coming from Basel and the newly empowered Financial Stability Board. This regulatory agenda now includes a combination of better disclosures, stricter supervision and simplification and comparability of risk measures. A standardised model is, model is hoped for. However, it is still all about capital at risk, not about the firm at risk. As we have seen in the current financial crisis, the two are not always correlated. The measures we use, capital at risk, is simply a way to count down to failure, not a way to manage risk so that we prevent failure. It is to address a standardised, improved model that we introduce a new method of enterprise risk management. It bridges the gap between the direct alignment of financial performance metrics and risk exposure metrics. This met method, which we call risk accounting, enables the risk appetite setting process to be metricized and become an integral part of the financial planning and budgeting cycle. It is reasonable for investors to complain that current risk disclosures are, let's say, opaque, to put a positive spin on it. 
It is also reasonable to understand the mood of society in regard to the bid-rigging scandals, the debate on high-speed trading, and the processing disruptions and security breaches that have become commonplace in financial firms. Regulators have set the context for the ecosystem in which ERM systems must function. In the end, regulators want to extract common risk data so they can benchmark results and perform systems-wide risk analysis. At the same time, they want the culture of finance to evolve to a better state and for management accounting and performance measures to be integrated within the, en within the enterprise's risk management ecosystem. We should also be driven by our firm's own self-interest to transform regulatory mandates into an improved state of internal risk management with new ideas given license by regulators. So let's take the bait. It is our industry's problem to fix. If we leave it to regulators and legislators, the result will be a political solution which may wind up not solving the problem. Look at what we have to show for it so far a capital at risk regime that penalizes firms for being big, a patchwork of capital and contract market infrastructure that is springing leaks daily, perhaps with another disastrous flash crash looming, and our financial institutions being asked to write their death wish in the form of living wills. A serious set of unintended consequences has arisen in attempting to move OTC derivatives markets onto new trading and clearing infrastructures too quickly. Here, a first attempt at standardizing data and using a global system for uniquely identifying counterparties and the contracts they trade in is not working. In Germany, their financial regulator, BaFin, has enlisted auditors to supervise regulation of the OTC derivatives markets, which firms have to pay for directly. A global identification system, sometimes referred to as the barcode for banking, beyond its use in swaps data reporting, which, as I said, is not going well, should help to solve the data quality issues we live with every day. It should lower infrastructure costs and allow for both straight through processing and proactive risk management. I'll discuss this FSB initiative in greater detail shortly. So let's first set the context of a proactive risk management regime, that is putting the management into the risk management definition. Risk management is being able to foresee and then forecast within a level of confidence an occurrence and its consequence. Risk management and the ERM system must support a proactive observation of the effects of an event on the performance and risk profile of the firm. It must minimize the lack of understanding and consequence of an anticipated or unexpected event through access to high quality data. Management must be in a position to mitigate or withstand an anticipated or unexpected event through the observations available from the enterprise's risk management system. Most importantly, the ERM system must enable management to mitigate any adverse effects on the firm's financial performance and its survivability under stress circumstances. But before we turn to risk management, we must first make sure we can measure risk. However, measures that do not allow for proactive risk management are of no consequence. For example, we can know how severe a volcano's eruption, eruption could be and how often that will occur. But we really want to be able to read a seismometer and see the eruption building up in real time so we can get out of the way. We need measures of risk that are meaningful to mitigate risks proactively. The benchmark for the standard measure of risk is value at risk or VAR. VAR is a method of measuring risk that indicates the degree of losses that can be incurred over a given period of time and for a given level of confidence. VAR provides a single statistical measure of the probability of loss. VAR-derived methods suffer a number of limitations. Automated systems use different calculation methods for VAR, use different time periods, and use non-standard data inputs that lead to inaccurate outputs. Contrary to popular thought, VAR is not a maximum loss figure, 
VAR's regulated statistical confidence level predicts it will be the minimum twice a year loss. VAR mainly is used for as a soft limit, almost a regulatory data point that has only limited use and none especially in stress situations. In Basel's regulatory frameworks, they are attempting to balance risk sensitivity against simplicity and comparability. We will describe this new framework in greater detail shortly. To give credit to Basel, its announced revisions to the minimum capital requirement for market risk gave recognition to the limitations of VAR, in good measure prompted by the dog and the frisbee speech noted here by Andy Haldane. It implied a search for better measures of risk. The dog and the frisbee analogy equated the risk regime as an equivalent to an attempt to calculate the flight of the frisbee and the pursuit of the dog to catch the frisbee. The mathematics of doing this analysis is, or let us say, formidable. In Haldane's view, as formidable as the risk mathematics accepted into the Basel risk calculations. His point, the dog learns by intuition to catch the frisbee. We need to rely more on intuition and seasoned judgment than mathematics. We believe that our risk accounting method and its calculations of risk in a new metric we call risk units is the new and improved measure of risk that all seek and that is implied in Basel's framework and in Haldane's speech. It improves upon the known deficiencies of VAR and other stochastic methods for enterprise-wide risk management and Peter will describe the risk accounting method in context of an ERM system a bit later. A standard measure of risk must be accompanied by standards for the data that goes into the risk calculations, no matter what calculations are agreed to by regulators. One of the six regulatory initiatives I will discuss a bit later is the Global Identification Scheme of the FSB. It is a first step towards aggregating data by prescribing a standard and globally unique identifier for financial market participants. Known as the Legal Entity Identifier, the LEI initiative is intended to allow for aggregating counterparty risk exposures and systemic risk analysis. With it, standard measures of risk calculated on properly aggregated position data and cash flows can be computed. It is a start, but still needs help from the industry to get it right. So now on to what is an ERM system. What is it supposed to do? Enterprise Risk Management, or ERM, is a process aided by technology, overseen by a board of directors, implemented and reported on by management and their staffs. It is designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity adversely to be used in strategy setting and across the enterprise by an entity's management. Its purpose is to manage risk within an entity's risk appetite and to provide reasonable, assur reasonable assurance of the achievement of an entity's strategic objectives. It should be noted that reporting to regulators is not mentioned in this definition, although most enterprise risk management systems appear to be geared to regulatory reporting, especially about capital adequacy. Our ERM notions are challenged by risk events that do not trigger accounting events, such as risk concentrations of counterparties and asset liability funding gaps. We live with uncertainty due to flawed risk methodologies and poor data, different versions of the same capital and profit concepts and no ability to reconcile them, dependency on overly complex financial models, stakeholders' limited understanding of statistical theory and assumptions, a lack of comparability of risk quantification results within and between firms, prescriptive accounting standards and non-prescriptive risk standards, and with the mispricing of risk in products that are traded with counterparties. These flaws and many others challenge our ERM systems way beyond our own enterprise due to the interconnectedness of the global financial system. It creates for, for us all the fear of the contagion of systemic risk. It challenges us to do better. So are we up to the ERM challenge? Let's start by looking at the problem of enterprise risk management from an accounting perspective. Accounting involves the registration of all transactions upon their approval in accounting systems, that is, in the general ledger and its subordinate subledgers. 
Also, upon registration, each transaction is tagged with codes that are used by computers to ensure it follows its correct aggregation paths into its performance and management information systems. From the codes tagged onto transactions, they can be aggregated to give us, for example, business line profitability, customer profitability, product profitability, legal entity profitability, geographic profitability, and so on. We also capture transaction values on registration, which can be, for example, historic cost, notional value, or mark-to-market values, and there may be other values. Almost by instinct, accountants embed control totals based on transaction values throughout their reporting processes to ensure they are complete and accurate. And all accounting data is generally tied back to its source, which is the general ledger, and in turn to its sub-ledgers. So when thinking about enterprise risk in the accounting context, we can start to think whether we can tag transactions with risk codes that can be used in a standardized calculation of each transaction's exposure to risk. Regulators are now suggesting we look to accounting as a base for an enterprise's risk regime. With this, we concluded that there is a need for new, perhaps parallel technique to our current best practices, one based upon accounting and management information systems. We will discuss this in greater detail when Peter describes our risk accounting methodology a bit later in the presentation. The recent regulatory initiatives you see here are part of a six-part coordinated set of risk directives pushing us closer to an accounting-like approach to risk. An effective risk appetite framework is dependent on the ability to aggregate risk data that are being controlled against accounting records. The development of a positive risk culture is dependent on the implementation of an effective risk appetite framework. And this is only achievable if there is a greater degree of simplicity and comparability in the regulatory framework. Simplicity and comparability require global identification standards for legal entities, products and events. Risk aggregation in conjunction with global identification standards can provide a viable foundation on which the risk management frameworks and infrastructures envisaged by the Basel committees and FSB's initiatives can be realized. Taken together, they set out the means to risk adjust the financial system by directing financial firms and regulators to collect standardized data and analyze it in standard ways. This would then allow benchmarking of industry standards of risk adjusted performance and the oversight of systemic risk. However, this requires a universally accepted method of calculating exposure to risk using a standardized and additive measure of risk exposure. This is possible, and Peter will show you our method for doing just that a bit later on. For now, let's take a further look at the way these regulations, reg regulations assist us in getting real on ERM. The Global Identification System of the FSB and the risk aggregation principles of Basel work together in the ERM pie slice we see here under the title Risk Systems and Data. Let's take a closer look at each of the regulations. First, Basel has defined the term risk data aggregation to mean defining, gathering and processing risk data according to the bank's risk reporting requirements. To this end, the FSB has developed a set of regulatory expectations where regulators and firms are confident that the management, information and risk reports accurately capture the risks of the institution. The first financial firms to come under scrutiny are the 30 globally systemically important banks. The standards they set for their implementation will certainly trickle down to us all. Remember, these large banks are intermediaries in most transactions of all other financial institutions. The deadline for these largest financial institutions to meet these expectations is the beginning of 2016, not very far away. The expectations are high, as we will see on the next slide. Basel's <coughs> Risk Data Aggregation and Risk Reporting Mandate, also known as BCBS239, is giving us the cover to get budgets allocated so that firms can enhance their technology infrastructure for reporting information to the board and senior management. They want firms to improve their decision-making process through higher data quality that is reconciled with the books and records of the firm. 
They also want to enhance the management of information across legal entities while facilitating a comprehensive assessment of risk exposures at the global consolidated level. Most importantly, they seek to reduce the probability and severity of losses resulting from data and risk management weaknesses, improve the speed at which information is available, and improve each organization's ability to manage the risk of new products and services. To accomplish this, they are requiring controls surrounding risk data to be as robust as those applicable to accounting data, that risk data be reconciled to accounting data, that a financial institution should strive towards a single authoritative source for risk data, that risk reports should be comprehensive and include all risks, stress testing results, inter and intra risk concentrations and funding positions and plans. Finally, and most importantly to the regulators, reports should include capital adequacy, regulatory capital and capital ratio projections. Now that's quite a tall order in such a short time. To assist in this data aggregation effort, regulators realised that global data standards were needed as a prerequisite. The issue has been taken up by the Financial Stability Board, a creation of the G20, that is being given the mandate to oversee on a global basis the contagion of systemic risk. The Legal Entity Identify Initiative, the LEI, is to be a system to identify a unique and global standard for every financial market participant. This will enable regulators to aggregate data across an enterprise and to observe systemic risk across the financial system. The impetus for this project came from observing the reasons for the failure of Lehman Brothers and in its aftermath of trying to understand its exposure to others and others' exposures to Lehman. There was no consistency in identifying Lehman or to associate all of Lehman's products and businesses into a total view of the exposure others had to Lehman should it fail. In effect, no one, not regulators, nor creditors, nor counterparties, could see into Lehman's exposure to risk. Everyone doing business in the financial system will eventually have to get an LEI. Every security, security issuer or financial contract creator will have to get a UPI, a unique product identifier. And every financial transaction will have to have a UTI, a unique transaction identifier, attached to it. This initiative is one of the cornerstones of the Basel Risk Data Aggregation Mandate and critical to the quality data issue that plays such a critical role in having confidence in our risk measurement and reporting systems. Next we look at the ERM Pi Slice Risk Models and the effect Basel's simplicity and comparability discussion paper has on our ERM model. The Basel Committee set out to adjust the capital framework with a view to reducing any undue complexity and improving the comparability of its outcomes. The discussion paper sets out the reasons behind the evolution of the current framework and outlines the potential benefits and costs that arise from a more risk-sensitive methodology. While the committee had not made a decision to pursue any of the ideas presented, they did put into the mindset of firms' risk management thought leadership the idea of a more understandable risk regime built around the attributes of all good managers and leaders – judgment, intuition and experience – not built upon a blind devotion to model outcomes. Basel believes that a standardised approach, in conjunction with any advanced approaches, would lead to regulators' ability to benchmark results amongst institutions. Next we focus on the two pie slices, capital requirements and risk metrics, and the impact Basel's large exposure reporting mandate has on our ERM model. Basel's large exposure framework is a tool for limiting the maximum loss a bank could face in the event of a sudden counterparty failure. Basel's definition of large exposure is the sum of all exposure to a counterparty or to a group of connected counterparties. That exposure value is deemed large if it is equal to or above 10% of the bank's eligible capital base. Further, the sum of all the exposure to a single counterparty or to a group of connected counterparties must not be higher than 25% of the bank's available eligible capital base. This makes the ability to aggregate exposures to a counterparty or its parent entity paramount. 
The Legal Entity Identifier Initiative explained earlier is a critical pillar of determining large exposures as is the ability to roll up the individual legal entities to its parent, a component of the LEI initiative not yet in place. The timeline the committee has set for full implementation was the first of the year 2019. We still have a bit of a breather, but considering the other things set, in, set out in the overall risk mandates, it's still a stretch. Next, we focus on the three pie slices, risk appetite, risk limits and risk tolerance, and the impact FSB's risk appetite reporting mandate has on our ERM model. This mandate is loaded with ERM actions. The FSB's risk appetite framework requires an actionable and measurable risk appetite statement. There are high expectations for turning the risk appetite framework into measurable and actionable activities to enable risk capacity, risk appetite, risk limits and risk profile to be considered both at the legal entity level and the group or parent level. The FSB ties a sound risk culture to the firm's risk appetite but leaves the rest of the financial firms to figure out how to operationalize a risk appetite statement into meaningful indicators and aggregatable risk measures and how to tie this to the firm's risk culture. Last but certainly not least is the FSB's risk culture mandate, the most important part of bringing our financial firms out of the muck of bid rigging scandals, disruptions of markets, Ponzi schemes, misappropriating client funds, obfuscating product risk and equating complexity with high return. This can be thought of as the soft side of risk management. We think it is the most important part of ERM. The FSB defines risk culture as the norms of behavior for individuals and groups within an organization that determine the collective ability to identify and understand, openly discuss and act on the organization's current and future risk. The FSB defines the expectations of a sound risk culture to be based on a risk reward balance consistent with, consistent with the institution's risk appetite, an effective system of controls, a heightened expectation for the quality of risk models and data accuracy, and a catch-all capability to accurately measure risks along with justifications for risk taking that can be challenged by regulators. They leave us to ponder with this caveat that Culture concerns behaviours and attitudes that can be difficult to assess and interpret, and indicators should not be treated as a checklist or looked at in isolation. Finally, they set a challenge for regulators by saying that regulatory personnel who interact with boards on their observations of a sound risk culture need to be senior, properly experienced and able to exercise judgment. Again, a tall order that to our mind leaves both the concept of risk appetite and risk culture vague, judgmental and sets us all up, regulators and financial institutions alike, for contentious and perhaps even bitter dialogue on these key attributes of the risk regime. It is to this point that Premier's, Premier's Blue Ribbon Advisory Board, of which I am a member, addressed its comments to the FSB, which we summarise on the next slide. Let me uh, paraphrase what I and colleagues said to the FSB. To model and monitor risky behaviour will require cooperation by regulators in the application of subjective judgments of good versus bad behaviour or risky versus appropriate behaviour. Even judging the tone at the top set by boards and their management has characteristics of subjectivity requiring regulators judgments. Given such subjectivity across many jurisdictional boundaries, what we as risk professionals have to offer is a direction toward a quantitative floor for boards and their management from which to allow supervisors to make consistent judgments. What I and my colleagues suggested formally to the FSB was to develop key risk culture indicators or KRCIs for benchmarking risky versus good behavior. And what we are suggesting to you is to incorporate these metrics and other KPIs and KRIs into a standard metric like VAR but only better, the risk unit I mentioned earlier. Peter will expand on this shortly. 
We made the point earlier that the FSB's Global Identification Scheme and its associated reference data are critical to the Basel's risk data aggregation mandates. Why? First, risk exposures are, in part, the consequence of the failed and or insecure interaction of manually implemented policies and processes with automated processes and with data, usually flawed data, relative to the processing of transactions and the reporting of financial risks. The problem of faulty and ambiguous data creates huge operational risk as transactions cannot be processed in any reasonably automated and complete manner, what we refer to as straight through processing. This failure is compensated for by requiring human interaction and reconciliation procedures across all the business silos that comprise a global financial institution. The improper interaction of human and automated process on data causes risk. Streamline the processes, automate the interactions, reduce the incidence of faulty data, and we can eliminate operational risk or at least minimize it. And it is not only operational risk. The consequences of faulty data impacts data aggregation in general, which causes the risk calculations of the desk or department or of the firm overall to be questioned, certainly with no assurance that the daily numbers are correct and certainly with limited confidence that risk management and regulatory reports are accurate. It also extends to the firm's book, regulatory and economic capital calculations. In accounting terms, the comfort of accuracy means that auditors have found no material weaknesses in the firm's books of record and the controls that support the accuracy of the data recorded. That is, in essence, what the regulators are aiming for in the economic and risk-adjusted regulatory capital calculations of the firm from the six regulatory directives we have just discussed. And to extend the materiality metaphor of an audit to the risk dynamic further, these three pillars you see here on the left are also the levers of risk mitigation. If we could only drill down through the ERM system to the causal factors that are affecting a build-up in risk exposure, then we can mitigate those risks from causing losses. By making changes in the human processes and policies, the data quality and the systems. So how do we get to develop an ERM system that gives us such capabilities from where we are starting from today? The regulators have given us the implementation incentive, we just have to run with it. For example, the long missing standard identification scheme will permit data aggregation across business silos, both for ERM and across financial institutions for systemic risk analysis. The call in BCBS 239 to reconcile risk data with accounting data should give us a single authoritative source of risk data. Regulators' ideas around simplicity of risk measures should incent us to build ERM systems that manage risk so that we can mitigate risk, not just manage capital at risk. And finally, it should all lead to quantifying risk appetite and providing objective measures of risk culture to sit side by side with boards and regulators' judgments. This then should allow boards to expect management's priority to be to observe risk exposures before they become losses. This can then become the new order for risk management and for the ERM systems that support it. In this section, we're going to switch into solution mode and describe the risk quantification technique that we, we refer to as risk accounting. Risk accounting sits at the core of the ERM ecosystem and enables banks to respond to the six new regulatory mandates from the Basel Committee and Financial Stability Board that Alan has already described in some detail. If we want to create an effective ERM framework, we must be able to aggregate risk data in an effective and meaningful way. This is precisely what Basel's risk data aggregation mandate, otherwise known as BCBS 239, is demanding of us. So let's start with what we view as the blindingly obvious. We need two things if we're going to aggregate risk data effectively. The first is standardized identification systems. If we want to aggregate data that's spread across multiple systems in multiple locations by, for example, legal entity, we need to tag standardized legal entity identifiers onto each item of data so computers know which hierarchical aggregation paths the data should follow. The second is a standardized risk exposure quantification method. We can't validly consolidate and aggregate data if the quantitative values assigned to them are produced by different measurement methods. 
For example, miles and kilometers measure the same thing, distance, but we can't aggregate miles and kilometers and expect to get a meaningful result. So with the FSB already embarked on a global identification scheme, albeit to this point lacking any means for creating hierarchical ownership structures, which is important for calculating risk exposures, my key question for this session is, in the absence of a standardized and universally accepted method of calculating exposure to risk, is it possible to establish an effective ERM framework? And here we have the problem. On this slide, we've listed a selection of methods used by risk managers and accountants to identify, quantify, and report exposure to risk. Each one of these methods produces outputs that could loosely be termed risk data. All of these methods are vital for ensuring that risks are properly managed at the granular level, but again, at the risk of stating the blindingly obvious, we can't aggregate them by simply adding them together because the methods used to produce the outputs are all different. We have a particular issue with RAG assessments shown in the left column. Here we identify risk and assess the likely impact by using a system of three colours, red, amber, green. Unfortunately, we can't consolidate and aggregate colours, and yet this is the technique that is universally used by financial firms to manage their operational risks. So does this mean that we should conclude that the real ERM, as envisaged through the six new regulatory mandates, is unachievable? It possibly is unless we can think of something new. So let's start by looking at the problem from an accounting perspective. Accounting involves the registration of all transactions upon their approval in accounting systems. Financial control has learned a long time ago how to tag codes onto transactions to define the aggregation paths they should follow in order to produce the reports they require. The first system of coding adopted by financial controllers was the Standard Chart of Accounts, or SCA, that enables the aggregation of accounting data by account code within the general ledger, which in turn provides the basis for preparing financial statements. As reporting requirements evolved, other codes were added, and we have a few examples on this slide. With these codes attached to each transaction, we can now generate profitability reports covering, for example, business line, customer, product, legal entity, uh, geographic location, and so on. We also capture transaction values on registration, which can be, for example, historic cost, notional value, or mark-to-market values, and there may be other values. When thinking about risk data aggregation in the accounting context, we started to think whether we could tag a new transaction value onto each transaction, i.e. its exposure to risk. We asked ourselves this question, which is at the bottom of this slide. If we could tag transactions with risk codes that can be used in a standardized calculation of each transaction's exposure to risk, would that begin to solve our risk data reconciliation and data integrity problem? If that were possible, and we believe it is, we could call the method aptly risk accounting, which is in fact what we do. It's now that we need to engage in some re revolutionary out-of-the-box thinking. The first point is that any universal measurement met uh, method uh, needs a common standardized unit of measurement. A natural currency is not a good standard unit of measurement for risk quantification reporting for the reasons shown on this slide. First, there are many currencies and their values relative to each other are constantly changing. Second, the quantification of exposures to financial risks in monetary terms typically involves the application of quantitative modeling techniques that are difficult to standardize, are invariably complex and inherently lagging. And last, but perhaps most, most significantly, exposures to non-financial risks, for example operational risk, cannot be validly expressed in monetary terms. We concluded that the answer was to create a new metric, a common standardized unit of risk measurement we call the risk unit, or RU. If we can accept that, life in the world of risk reporting starts to become a lot easier. Our proposition is that financial firms can validly report the risks they accept absolutely and in comparison to others by using our new risk metric, the risk unit, or RU. The adoption of this new risk metric for risk reporting, i.e. the risk unit, will challenge the senses of many of us. 
But any new measurement system and common unit of measurement begins as an abstraction, but through its active use, it evolves into something that is universally and intuitively understood. For example, when standard setting bodies first created standard units of measurement for such diverse things as credit quality, body temperature and distance, they had little meaning. They were abstractions. But after years of use, our brown brains now intuitively interpret what these measurement systems represent. We instinctively know that a AAA rating represents high credit quality. Somebody with a body temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit or 39 degrees centigrade is unwell. And 26 miles or 42 kilometers is a very long way to run. Our expectation is that the risk unit or RU applied to ERM systems will similarly achieve the same degree of intuitive interpretation over time, but giving us some immediate and significant benefits as well. So how do we calculate the RU's transaction by transaction? In the short term available, we hope to at least give you a sense of how the risk accounting method works, but we have other more detailed resources and worked examples available in the form of research working papers that are in the public domain. We'll provide details of where you can find these at the end of the session. But in summary, we start with the transactions value and map it to something called a value table, basically a weighted and scaled measure that allows results to be benchmarked and compared against banks of any size. Here we look up the applicable value band weighting and assign it to the transaction. We then determine what risks are triggered by the transaction and go to the relevant product risk lookup tables where we ascertain the applicable product risk weightings and assign them to each transaction. For example, credit product risk weightings are based on expert assessments made of the underlying product's collateral by reference to its value retention properties and the degree of anticipated difficulty in arriving at a liquidation price upon disposal. This product by product risk assessment is then scaled to a weighting of between 1 and 20. Each transaction's inherent risk in our use is then arrived at by multiplying the value band weighting by the product risk weightings. We then calculate the risk mitigation index or RMI for each transaction. The basis for the calculation is best practice scoring templates. For each of the categories shown here under processing risks we have reference data, operations and core systems and then credit, market and liquidity risks. Experts from our early pilots have identified, weighted and scaled these best practices and best practice benchmarks that affect risk mitigation to a range of between 0 and 100. So an RMI of 100 means that risk mitigation is perfect and the inherent risk of a transaction is mitigated to 0. But in our experience of using this method over many years, an RMI of 100 simply never occurs. There is always going to be some residual risk. And then we calculate the residual risk in RUs, which is the inherent risk reduced by the RMI as a percentage. I'll leave this slide there for a few seconds so that you can take a look. Uh, here is an interpretation of risk accounting's three core metrics. Inherent risk in RUs is representative of the transaction's maximum potential for loss. The risk mitigation index is a measure of the effectiveness of the enterprise in mitigating inherent risk through the effective management and control of the firm's operating environment. And residual risk in our use is representative of the probability of unexpected loss being the portion of the inherent risk not covered by effective risk mitigation, that being the risk exposure valued in our use. Most importantly, the risk weights, value tables and risk mitigation index are built from the ground up allowing for the inherent and intuitive intellectual property of operating management's risk understanding to be embedded in the very fabric of the risk measurement system. With such understanding of the derivation of the numbers in the minds of management, not embedded in an unfathomable calculation in a black box, risk mitigation returns to an intuitive management process. So quite simply, if the risk mitigation index is low, the probability of unexpected loss is high. Or said another way, if the credit risk mitigation index is low, there's a high probability that loans have been approved that shouldn't have been approved. 
or if the market risk mitigation index is low, there's a high probability that traders are operating unauthorized positions and so on. The longer term view is that the RMI will ultimately become a primary determinant of risk exposures and the key metric that signals the overall risk culture of the organization. We hope we've been able to demonstrate how the segments on the outer perimeter of the diagram shown on this slide each interacts with the six new regulatory mandates we highlighted earlier. The resulting integrated ERM ecosystem is supported at its core by a single authoritative source of risk data which is derived from accounting data and denominated in risk units or RUs. This is how risking risk accounting allows us to get real on ERM. And this summary diagram is our attempt to visually put all the pieces that comprise the data and risk management ecosystem into its place. All that we have spoken to, risk appetite, risk limits, risk culture, risk metrics, risk to tolerance, you see here orbiting around its center sun that holds it all together. That center has two dimensions, risk data, for without it we cannot get to aggregating risk exposures in some consistent and standardized way, the risk unit, which is our objective, and risk accounting, the ability to aggregate risk exposures in a consistent, standard and comparable way, and do it through integrating the risk data with the firm's books and records. To summarize, if we seize the moment revealed by the failure of Lehman Brothers, the realization by regulators that risk management, data management and technology are intertwined, then we may well be embarking on a long journey to re-engineer our own firm's technology infrastructure to enable better risk management, made possible by the re-engineering of the infrastructure of global finance that regulators are demanding and leading us toward around the simple but paradigm shifting concepts of a global identification system and accounting principles best practices applied to risk data. That concludes our presentation. Um, as mentioned earlier, there are more detailed descriptions of the concepts we've introduced today that can be accessed through our website uh, financialintergroup.com and clicking on research papers. There is also a research working paper with the title Risk Accounting, an accounting-based approach to measuring enterprise risk and risk appetite that can be downloaded from the Social Sciences Research Network, SSRN, website. This paper summarizes the research conducted into risk accounting to date in collaboration with our academic partners. If you Google SSRN, Risk Accounting, you'll find the link to the paper. As mentioned earlier, this uh, Q&A session hasn't been recorded, but we have prepared a transcript that can be downloaded from our website, financialintergroup.com, and clicking on Articles. Thank you for your interest in this premier webinar.